mountains for us to 68 kilograms. You got to, the spin in these things, folks. That's why a lot of folks turn in early in the morning. These things post about six o'clock every morning. Next up, Thompson Prison to double workforce by 2018. The Thompson, Illinois prison will double in employment in the next year, adding another 300 employees. U.S. Representative Sherry Bustos said after a tour there. Bustos and U.S. Senator Dick Durbin, both of Illinois, Democrats, met with Warden Don, Warden Don Hudson, and staff for an update on the continued activation of the facility by the Bureau of Prisons. And folks, I'm going to close this one out last, then we're going to go ahead and get to the McGuffey's Readers, the 200-year-old textbooks used to help train prisoners, prison inmates, and even regular schools how to read, write, and do arithmetic about 200 years ago. Anyway, this next one's a bad one. Uh, my, my essay, My San Antonio, there's a picture of the inmate. says, man gets, oh boy, I can't even see it, eight years in prison for throwing a cat under a passing truck. A San Antonio man has been sentenced to eight years in prison for throwing a cat under a passing truck that killed the feline last December. According to Animal Care Services, witnesses saw Gennaro Perales, 25, throw a black and white cat named Sebastian beneath a truck off Interstate 35 near Martin Street. Witnesses said it appeared that Perales picked up the cat, owned by a 16-year-old boy in the area, and threw the feline under the truck on purpose. Law enforcement officers came out and arrested Perales at the scene. Now, two people showed up. The Central Patrol Property Crimes Unit showed up of the San Antonio Police Department and ACS Cruelty Investigators. They were able to build a prosecutable case based on state laws governing animal cruelty. The charge was increased to a state jail felonies because of Perales' previous unrelated convictions. Okay, it's time for the school bell. More Guffey's Readers coming up soon. Now up, a sample of the McGuffey's Reader's nearly 200-year-old textbooks used to help instill moral fiber, the ability to read, write, do arithmetic, and do some actual life lessons uh, as well. I have a copy of these McGuffey Reader's. This is called McGuffey Reader's Fourth Eclectic Reader. I'm going to start with a story called Where There's a Will, There's a Way. Henry Bond was about 10 years old when his father died. His mother found it difficult to provide support for the large family, thus left entirely in her care. By good management, however, she contrived to do so and also to send Henry, the oldest child, to school and to supply him, for the most part, with the books that he needed. At one time, however, Henry wanted a grammar, or called a grammar book, in order to join a class in that study, and his mother could not furnish him with the money to buy it. He was very much troubled about it and went to bed with a heavy heart, thinking, what could be done? On waking in the morning, he found that a deep snow had fallen and the cold wind was blowing furiously. Ah, said he, it's an ill wind that blows nobody good. He rose, ran to the house of a neighbor, and offered his services to clear a path around his premises for the neighbor. The offer was accepted. Having completed this work and receiving his pay, He went to another place for the same purpose, then to another and another until he earned enough by shoveling snow to buy that grammar book. When school commenced, Henry was in his seat, the happiest boy there, ready to begin the lessons in his new book. From that time, Henry was always the first in all his classes. He knew no such word as fail, but always succeeded in all the things he attempted to. Having the will, he said, I found a way. Now, folks, I'll apologize in advance. Between these lessons, the children, the 200-year-old lessons, had to pick out some slate and a piece of chalk and do a lesson, and they had to also listen or recite a piece of poetry. I'm not a poetry reader, but I'm going to read this poetry anyway so that we can have some authenticity to what was it like to be an inmate child 200 years ago or try to learn. Well, here's the poem. A bright, merry boy with a laughing face, whose every motion was full of grace, who knew no trouble and feared no care, was the light of our household, the youngest there. He was too young, this little elf, with the troublesome questions to vex himself. 
But for many days a thought would arise and bring a shade to his dancing eyes. He went to one whom he thought more wise than any other beneath the skies. Mother, one word that makes the home, tell me when will tomorrow come. It is almost night, the mother said, and time for my boy to be in bed. When you wake up and it's day again, it will be tomorrow, my darling then. The little boy slept through all the night, but woke with the first red streak of light. He pressed a kiss to his mother's brow and whispered, Is it tomorrow now? No, little Eddie, this is today. Tomorrow was always just one night away. He pondered a while. But joy came fast, and with this vexing question, it quickly passed. But it came again with the shades of night. Will it be tomorrow? When is it light? From year to come, he seemed care to borrow. He tried so hard to catch tomorrow. You cannot catch it, my little Ted. Enjoy today, his mother said. Next story, a little Fred Liscomb and true manliness. "'Please, mother, do sit down and let me try my hand,' said Fred Liscomb, a bright, active boy, twelve years old. Mrs. Liscomb, looking pale and worn, was moving languidly about, trying to clear away the breakfast she had scarcely tasted. She smiled and said, "'You, Fred, you wash the dishes?' "'Yes, indeed, mother,' replied Fred. "'I should be a poor scholar if I couldn't, when time I've seen you wash them so many times. Just try me, mom.' A look of relief came over the mother's eyes, and she seated herself in her low rocking chair. Fred washed the dishes and put them in the closet. He then swept up the kitchen, brought up the potatoes from the cellar for dinner, and washed them and set out for school. Fred's father was away from home, and as there was some cold meat in the pantry, Mrs. Luscombe found it an easy task to prepare dinner. Fred hurried home from school, set the table, and again washed the dishes for his mother. He kept on in this way for two or three days till his mother was able to resume her usual work, and he felt amply rewarded when the doctor, who happened in one day, said, "'Well, madam, it's my opinion that you would have been quite sick, very sick, if you had not kept quiet.' The doctor did not know how the, quote, "'quiet had been secured, nor how the boy's heart bounded at these words. Fred had given up a great deal of what boys hold dear for the purpose of helping his mother— coasting down the hill and skating, and just at this time, it was just perfect to do skating right now. Besides this, his temper and his patience had been severely tried. He had been in the habit of going early to school and staying to play after it was dismissed. The boys, his friends, kind of missed him, and their curiosity was excited when he would not give any reason for him not coming to school earlier, or staying after school like he used to do. He always wanted to be at home. "'I'll tell you,' said Tommy Barton. "'I'll find him out, boys. See if I don't.' So he called for Fred to go to school, and on his way to the side door, walked lightly and somewhat nearer the kitchen window than was absolutely needful. Looking in, he saw Fred standing at the table with a dishcloth in his hand. Of course, he reported this at school, and various things and bad greetings were received by all. Fred received at recess. "'Well, you're a brave one to stay at home, pretty boy, washing dishes. "'Little girl, little girl boy, pretty pressy. <laughs> "'I like your apron, Polly.' "'Fred was not wanting in courage or spirit. "'He was strongly tempted to take the results into this fight "'and hit his tormentors. "'But his consciousness of right and his love for his mother "'helped him not to, not to swing. "'While he was struggling for self-mastery, "'his teacher appeared at the door of the schoolhouse.' Fred caught his eye, and it seemed to look as if to say, "'Don't give up. Be really brave, son.' He knew the teacher had heard the insulting taunts of the thoughtless schoolmates. The boys received notice during the day that Fred must not be taunted or teased in any manner. They knew that the teacher meant what he said, and so the brave boy had no further trouble. Just above the teacher's head was a cane and a large, thick switch. That seemed to do it for the rest of the time. Next up, and this will be our last one, folks, from McGuffey's Readers, called A Ship in a Storm. Did you ever go out far, far out into a great ocean? It's beautiful to be out there in the sea when the sea is smooth, 
But however, you let a storm approach, and that scene is changed. The heavy black clouds appear in the distance, and they throw a deep kind of a death-like shade over the waters. The captain sailors soon see in the clouds the signs of evil weather. All hands are then set to work to take in sail. The hoarse notes of the captain speaking through his trumpet are echoed from lip to lip among the rigging. Happy will it be if all is made snug before the gale strikes the vessel. At last the gale comes like a vast moving mountain of air. It strikes the ship. The vessel heaves and groans under the dreadful weight and struggles to escape through the foaming waters. If she is far out at sea, she will be likely to ride out the storm in safety. But if the wind is driving her upon the shore, the poor sailors will hardly escape being dashed upon the rocks and drowned. Once there was a ship in a storm. Some of her masts were already broken and her sails were lost. While the wind was raging and the billows were dashing against her, the cry was heard, A man has fallen overboard! Man overboard! Man overboard! Quickly was the boat lowered, and she was soon seen bounding on her way over the mountains of waves. At one moment the boat seemed lifted to the skies, and the next it sank way down low into the wave, lost as it looked beneath the wave. At length the man was found. He was well nigh drowned, but he was taken on board, and now they made for the ship. But the ship rolled so dreadfully that seemed certain death to go near her, and now what should they do? The captain told one of the men to get aloft, throw down a rope, throw that rope down, sailor. This was made fast to the boat, and when the sea was somewhat calm, it was hoisted, and all fell down into the ship with a dreadful crash. It was a desperate way of getting on board, but fortunately, no lives were lost. On the dangerous points along our seacoast are lighthouses, which can be seen far out at sea and serve as guides to the ships. Now, sometimes the fog is so dense that these lights cannot be seen out very far, but most lighthouses have great fog bells or fog horns. Some of the latter are made to sound by steam and can be heard for a long distance way out on that ocean. These bells and horns are kept sounding as long as the fog lasts. There are also many life-saving stations along the coast where trained men are ready with lifeboats. When a ship is driven ashore, they at once go to rescue those on board, and thus many valuable lives are saved. Taken in all, it's a sailor's life is a very hard one. Our young friends owe a debt of gratitude to those whose home is upon the great waters and who bring them the luxuries of other countries. Now, folks, as we get ready to wrap things up, we've heard a little bit here lately about a near shipwreck. A uh, fun thing to look about in the Bible it mentions the word ship or ships happening things about 71 times. And a lot of times some tough stuff is happening to the ship. Uh, the very first time ship is mentioned is Proverbs thirty nineteen, Talks about the way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid or a virgin. These are ways that talk about a certain type of grace, a certain type of elegance, the way real men conduct themselves. Now, over on Jonah, of course, Jonah went up, and that's where the shipwreck took him right out. He ended up broken down, cast into the sea, and the whole shot here. Now, in Matthew, uh, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, they were in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets when they had an experience with Jesus. Uh, also, it talks about uh, when people entered into a ship, and they passed over and came into their own city. So he got into the ship as part of kind of like a travel log. Now, the first time that I can find Jesus being mentioned in a verse and the word ship is in Matthew fourteen thirteen says, When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship unto a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And again, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And as we get ready to go ahead and close with some symbolic imagery, some symbolic imagery, Jesus told the disciples to get into the ship. And that has a lot of meaning. How about you out there? Are you queevish or squeamish about things concerning things of the Lord, things of the Bible, things of what Jesus Christ said? Is it something that you've heard about but never looked into much? Do you have a fear or a terror of reading a Bible cover to cover? What would it take to get you to read one? The most published book on the face of the earth. What would it take to get you to read that? And see what Jesus was talking about when he says, come on, man, get in the ship. You're going to find out some other things. Now, another little bit of information is when the shortest verse in the Bible 
is said to be what Jesus wept. Just just one little stanza with two words. 